scripture that we share today is from Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. It is a scripture that I did not go looking for, it found me, and particularly unique and scripture to speak from on a Mother's Day. As you know, if you've been here over the past few weeks, we've been working our way through 1 Timothy, and I didn't realize when we started that we would happen to hit this particular passage on Mother's Day. So here goes. I desire also that women should adorn themselves modestly and sensibly and seemly apparel, apparel, not with braided hair or golds or pearls or costly attire, but by good deeds as befits women who profess religion. Let a woman learn in silence with all submissiveness. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over men. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet woman will be saved through bearing children if she continues in faith and love and holiness with modesty. I think that what happened to, what happens to St. Paul in the modern world is akin to what happened the other day to the policeman in Huntington Beach who had on his hands a Channel 7 news crew that happened to be filming a strike of some city employee. The news cameramen were standing in the middle of the street and the policemen gave them several warnings asking them to quit blocking traffic. They refused and finally he wrote them a ticket. In revenge, the cameraman pointed to a vendor that came along and double parked and the next shot they showed was of persons coming to buy the goods from the vendor's truck. The implication being that the policeman was against newsmen but allowed other people to break the law. What they failed to note, however, in their film footage was that the second shot they had of the vendor was taken when he obeyed the patrolman's warning and legally parked his uh, vehicle. Thus, through a splice, the news team was able to portray the policeman in a way which was most unfortunate and not representative. And I'm afraid that it is rather easy to go through the New Testament and Paul's writings and splice out some particularly juicy, quote, anti-feminist passages, quote, and make Paul into a real woman hater. <laughs> Did someone say amen? <laughs> Fascinating also that uh, this week in America, the Episcopal Church should be trying a bishop who allowed a questionably ordained woman minister uh, serve communion and that the Dutch Reform Church in America which a number of leading churches in America and Southern California also belong to uh, again deferred from giving women ordination on the other hand there are churches like my own and like my own mother who have been ordained for and been ordaining for many many years and for whom this has never really been a serious controversy what can we say in regard to the role of women and this particular passage in specific? I think just by way of introduction, it should be noted that some use the scripture without really understanding it. There is a difference between quoting scripture and really getting behind the gist of what the scripture is saying. An example of a person who, whom I think uses scripture without understanding it is a fundamentalist book which I saw, which was entitled Bob Hare, Bossy Wives, and Women Preachers. And it did not take long to read the book and guess which way the writer was going and what he thought of women in general. There is, on the other hand, another temptation, and that is to neglect the scripture altogether in order to be culturally acceptable. So whatever the newest movement is, we as a church, so the temptation goes, want to be relevant to culture. So we seek to shape a conviction or a theology which is not seriously interacting with the Scripture. I would understand that whenever we look at the application of Scripture to a matter or to our culture, that we should attempt to integrate both the Scripture and the understanding of what is happening in our world. For in the final analysis as Christians, we are people of the book. It is the book which gives to us the Lord Jesus Christ, which give to us the record of doctrine and history which lead us into saving experience and relationship with the Lord. And we must be mindful to continue to study that book lest at any point in our pilgrimage 
we become static in our Christian experience. I like what a leading Christian theologian said about study of the scripture. The word has to be free to remake and reform the church over and over again. The moment the church loses interest in working the minds of the word because it thinks that it's seen all there is to see, that moment the church also loses its power and its credibility in the world. When the world thinks it knows, or when the church thinks it knows all there is to know, the opportunity for surprising discovery is closed. The church then becomes old, without perspective and without light and labor and fruitfulness. In today's passage of scripture, there are three perspectives of women that are particularly seen. First, the Christian woman and her cosmetics. Secondly, the Christian woman as a teacher in the Christian church. And third, the Christian woman as a mother. First, the Christian woman and her cosmetics. Verse 9, women should adorn themselves. The word for adorn is the word from which, of course, we have cosmos or world, or even the word cosmetic. It means simply to put in order or to arrange. And now all of you men can know what your wives are doing when they use cosmetics. They are putting in order and they are arranging. And hopefully for the better. <laughs> I would pronounce, if I had the authority, an anathema on all of those who use this scripture to keep or to make or to insist that women be as ugly as they could possibly be. And there have been those, unfortunately, who have forgotten that the scriptures say women should adorn, should cosmetize, if you want to anglicize the word, should cosmetize themselves. There's an interesting rule or law that was passed in 18th century English Parliament, which reads as follows. All women of whatsoever rank or degree that shall seduce or betray into matrimony any of his majesty's subjects by scent, paint, cosmetic washes, artificial teeth, false hair, Spanish wool, iron stays, hoops, high-heeled shoes, and bolstered hips, shall incur the penalty of the law in force against witchcraft and like demeanors, and the marriage upon conviction shall stand null and void. The opposite of cosmos is chaos, <laughs> and uh, evidently that's what the Parliament was looking for in that century. If you want an appreciation for what the word adorn can really mean in a, in a different context in Scripture, I would urge you to turn to the 21st chapter of Revelation, verse 2, where we have these words, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned adorned, same word, for her husband. And if you think that the Lord is going to send down a sloppy and ugly city, you are wrong. What is St. Paul up to in this particular passage on the Christian woman and her cosmetics? He is seeking to insist that the Christian woman place the stress of emphasis upon the development of her interior life, that the concern with the exterior not be such so that it becomes pushed out of order and even pushed into the first priority. It is indeed, as St. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, a parallel passage to this, Let not yours be outward adorning, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable jewel of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. The qualifications on outward adornment, which are suggested here by Paul, are that a woman should be outwardly adorned with modesty and sensibly. And in the King James, there's a very unfortunate translation, very difficult. To, it is uh, shamefacedness and sobriety. And the word shamefacedness creates the image of a gal walking around with her eyes fixed on the ground and being slightly embarrassed and red in the face that she is a woman. This is uh, really not the, the, the meaning or the understanding of the word at all. In fact, the word modestly, which is used here in the revised text, is uh, a in the Greek, the only time that this particular word is used in the New Testament, it can carry or connote the idea of respectfulness or respectability. It is perhaps best compared by contrasting what a, an, an immodest person would be. And certainly in the prophet Isaiah, verse uh, 16 through 23 of chapter 3, we get an idea of what immodesty in dress might be, where Isaiah indicates, Behold, 
The Lord says, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, tinkling with their feet, the Lord will smite with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will lay bare their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands, the crescents, the pendants, the bracelets, the scarfs, the headdresses, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes, and the amulets, the festal robes, the mantles, the cloaks, the handbags, the garments of gauze, the linen garments, the turbans, and the veil. Twenty-one items of apparel indicating that the women of Isaiah's day that he particularly was referring to had made their whole world the world of exterior fashion. And Isaiah, like Paul, is calling upon the woman to be concerned with the inward adornment and cosmetic. Therefore, the word modesty, which can be used as a real sharp contrast with the kind of immodest dress which is, which is flagrantly dressed for the sake of dress itself and for the sake of attention, uh, the holy city is beautiful, it is glorious, that is the dress of women, but it is not uh, gaudy, so to speak, uh, or ne neither is it connoted with a sense of seducement or evil. The word which is translated sensibly carries with it the idea of good judgment or self-control, and it's the word that's also used as men. It's found in Titus chapter 2, verse 6. Likewise, urge the younger men to control themselves. So the same thing being asked of men is being asked of women here. Self-control or good judgment in dress. And furthermore, St. Paul says, in seemly apparel. The word for seemly is the same root as the word which is first uh, used for adorn. And it carries the idea in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. It's a word that's used of a bishop or a pastor. In that particular way, it's translated dignified. A pastor should be dignified. Same word. Uh, can, can mean that, in dignified or in respectably arranged apparel. St. Paul says, not with braided hair. This is something far more than taking your little girl and braiding her hair in piglets. The scripture is not forbidding that kind of braiding. But it was a particular hair fashion, evidently, of the period, and there are some writings of women being concerned with this, an elaborate coiffure, is that how you say it? I should know that, that uh, where a person spent practically all their time just... Uh, really getting their hair ready for an extravagant uh, entrance somewhere and elaborately uh, and decoratively arranged. And St. Paul is forbidding that kind of a thing which neglects the adornment of the inner spirit. He's also saying because this passage relates to persons in worship. You'll recall that verse 8 began, I desire that every place men lift holy hands. So both the teaching on men and women really have to do also with persons, Christians, in public worship together. And therefore, with some Christians of more adequate means than others, it would be inappropriate for Christians in Christian community to flaunt what they have in the eyes of those who do not have anything. Therefore, the restriction on gold, which would be ostentatious, and on pearls. The root word, by the way, is margaritas. I didn't realize this, but evidently if your name is Margaret, you mean a, your name means a valuable pearl. And also costly apparel. The word for costly is the word from which we derive Pluto and on to that Plutocrat and things like this. What is very costly and what is very precious, according to 1 Peter 3, is the adornment uh, or the jewel of a quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious or costly. Same word, not with costly adornment, but with an inner spirit, which is very precious. The Christian cosmetics, therefore, with good judgment, with common sense, with beauty, not with ostentatiousness, are are to characterize the Christian women, and good deeds are to emphasize the life of the Christian woman in her inner life. The emphasis is upon helping others rather than an inordinate attention to one's self. This befits a woman who professes religion or a reverence for God would perhaps be a better way of understanding it. John Benson, who was a colleague of John Wesley's, has a tremendous summary of this passage where he says of women's cosmetics, neither too costly or sordid, but what is neat and clean. What the apostle especially forbids is that immodest manner of dressing, which is calculated to excite impure desires in the spectators, or a vain admiration of the beauty of those that use it. Also that gaudiness or showiness of dress, which proceeds from vanity, wastes time and money, and so prevents many good works. Kind of a good summary, isn't it? I find it very difficult as a man to speak on these subjects. But St. Paul did, so I will too. There's a common sense approach, isn't there, in the gospel? It's just a kind of a beautiful thing and uh, a desire for women to be 
to be pretty, but not to uh, do what the Playboy philosophy has done with women. The Playboy philosophy has uh, so emphasized the exterior of women that the women's livers, and in this sense I think rightly, certainly protest the dehumanization of the woman. She's treated as an object, a thing, to be dressed up and admired by man, and there's no worth on the inner person. Scripture is talking about the inner worth and value of a human being, and stress is there. Now, what about the woman as a teacher in the Christian church? That's the next thing which Paul speaks of. Let a woman learn in silence with all submissiveness. This is a notoriously difficult text. If I were to identify three difficult texts in the New Testament, this would be one of the three that I would select. It is difficult because it involves, first of all, an understanding of the social and cultural background which the apostle, is, the apostle is writing in. Secondly, it involves understanding what he actually is saying. And thirdly, it involves interpreting it and applying it in light of today's uh, world and, and the church today as well. William Barclay in his Daily Study Bible gives a superb summary of the treatment of women in the Jewish and Greek background of the first century, and I simply use him at this point as a reference. He indicates that in in Jewish life of the first century, the woman was a thing, treated somewhat as a thing. She was at the disposal of her husband or her father. She was, in many uh, occasions, forbidden to learn the law. She had no part in the synagogue service. She sat apart in a synagogue, sometimes in an, uh, a, a room uh, or part of the synagogue that did not have a good view on the proceedings or good ventilation. A woman came to the synagogue to learn, or rather, a man came to the synagogue to learn, a woman came to hear. It was forbidden for a woman to teach in school, not even the youngest of children. A strict rabbi would not greet a woman on the street, even if it were his mother or wife or daughter. One rabbi said that woman's work is to send her children to the synagogue, to attend to domestic concerns, to leave her husband free to study in school, and to keep house for him till he returns. Some of you husbands are still saying that. No. Uh, a Jewish man in one of his prayers of the first century thanked God that he was not, quote, a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Barclay notes in the Greek background that at Ephesus, where the temple of Diana was located, the conditions were very similar to those at Corinth, where the temple was serviced by hundreds of priestesses in Ephesus called the Melis, uh, translated bees, whose function was to perform the service of priestess prostitute. If a Greek woman, woman was of higher and more refined status and culture, she lived a rather confined life. She might live in her own quarters, did not appear at meals, never appeared in the street alone, and never went to any public meetings. Given that kind of a background, therefore, one can begin to look at what Paul is actually teaching here, for his concern is quite obviously for the reputation of the church at Ephesus, that it not get in the standing of the community a reputation of being a loose house, or a place where the most unspeakable uh, social uh, discourtesies and unacceptable social standards were being practiced. That certainly is the kind of context from which this passage springs. When therefore he for example, starts out by saying, let a woman be silent. The word which is used for silent is the same word which is used in chapter 2, verse 2, in reference to that we may live a quiet and peaceable life. The word quiet in that particular context, verse 2, doesn't mean that you never speak. Uh, it perhaps uh, is a bringing up a situation that evidently existed at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33 to 36, where St. Paul says that a woman should not speak in church, but if they have any questions, they can ask their husbands at home. And from the best guess, the arrangement of Christian seating uh, of the church was that the women sat on one side and the, other, and the men on the other. If uh, a wife did not understand a particular thing that was being said, evidently in the church of Corinth, she would call out across to her husband, whatever his name was, uh, uh, Eutychus, uh, what did that just mean? You know, and that would create kind of uh, chaos in the congregation, so Paul says, uh, keep quiet. And, and the same kind of a thing is being enjoined here. We do know that providences existed in the church and that uh, women could pray in public, as evidenced by 1 Corinthians as well. So this was not a stricture on total quiet, but it was a kind of a quiet likeness. Um, he further restricts um, teaching and the authority of women in that Christian congregation. Uh, we see later by looking at Timothy and also Titus that there was a teaching role for women in regard to younger children. But he indicates, Paul does, that he himself does not allow women to teach, nor does he allow them to have authority over men. The word here, to have authority, is the only time it's used in the New Testament is in this passage, and it means to interrupt, to dictate, or to domineer over. Paul's rationale for this is based upon the creation, that Eve was more trusting uh, with uh, the serpent, therefore she was 
naturally beguiled by him, and therefore Paul is saying that uh, she demonstrates a greater uh, susceptibility to doctrinal error. Now, when we look at the interpretation and application of this, we have to ask the question, is this teaching a conditional teaching related to the circumstances of the first century churches and world, or is it an eternal teaching which is valid in churches for all centuries and all places at all times? I think we must understand uh, in looking at that particular question that there are some conditions that were evident among the women in the Ephesian church that were rather unique. We get glimpses of these from the letter itself. In chapter 5, verse 13 of 1 Timothy, Paul talks about some of the women in the church who are idlers, scatting from house to house, not only idlers, but gossips and busybodies. And evidently these were the same persons that were wanting to teach the Christian congregation. Also, in 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, Paul says that there are some false prophets who make their way into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and swayed by various impulses who will listen to anybody and can never arrive at a knowledge of the truth. There is a particular problem that is going on within the church, a susceptibility on the part of women to doctrinal error and an, and an ununderstanding or a non-understanding of Christian truth. The very fact that we need interpretation of this passage presupposes a fundamental thing that the Lord has placed in the church, and that is the office of teacher. If all of us, with our own insight, could totally understand and apply the scriptures, there would be no need for the office of a teacher. But it is all as we are taught that our individual faith in the scripture is informed and inspired. And there certainly is, in certain passages of the scripture, a need for an understanding of interpretation. For example, just to quote a few where we need understanding on interpretation. Genesis chapter 3 verse 16 indicates that the curse of woman from the fall is that she would bring forth children in childbearing, or she would bring forth uh, children with pain in her childbearing process. Uh, does this, therefore, a century ago, uh, nearly they were asking the question, does this prohibit the use of anesthesia for a woman in labor inasmuch as one will help ease some of the pain that was promised? And uh, we come to 1 Corinthians 14.35, where, uh, uh, where Paul says, Let a woman learn from her husband at home. Is he, in that passage, prohibiting women from ever enrolling in a course in which they would have an education as a result of it going through that course? When Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, that when men are in public in prayer, they should lift hands in prayer. Does this mean, therefore, in, our, in a particular assembly where it is not maybe a common practice always to lift hands that one is not really pleasing God if hands are not lifted. In 1, Corinthians, in 1 Thessalonians 5.26 and in four other passages in the New Testament, it speaks of the fact that we should greet one another with a holy kiss. And of course, we, we interpret that by saying this means give a good handshake all around, since we as Americans are a little leery of getting that close to someone of the same sex. And uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 says that a bishop and later a deacon must be the husband of one wife. And we need to Interpret that and say, does this mean that a bachelor, like Ken Wayman, for example, cannot be a deacon? And he, by the way, as we all know, has worked on that. Uh, in, uh, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, verses 3 to 10, we find the office of a widow, which was an office in the early church for those widows who were 60 years of age and over and had met certain qualifications. The obvious intent is that if they met certain qualifications, they could be on the in effect, welfare role of the church as well as have a valid ministry. If the conditions of a society change so that the economic needs of a widow are met through other agencies, uh, is there then a re-examination possible as to whether or not there should be an office for a widow? First Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, St. Paul says, Don't drink water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your often infirmities. We need interpretation as to whether it's okay. For example, if you have a good water supply, like we do and he didn't, to drink water, uh, in plenteous amounts, is it all right to take anison or broma seltzer or, or alka seltzer or whatever? I think that in regard to the role of women, the church is facing today probably what uh, some in the church were faced with nearly a, uh, over a century ago on the subject of slavery. There were those who could look uh, to the certain passages, lift them uh, out in certain kinds of ways, and use them as an argument for the perpetuation of slavery. Uh, but the question has to be asked in looking at a particular text, and even looking at this text of Scripture, is this a Scripture which is given on a condition which prevailed within a particular society for a particular period of time, or is it an eternal uh, issue which uh, is unchanged and unmitigated over the years? 
I think one clue may help us look at this, and I know on, on Mother's Day I feel terribly embarrassed that I'm making you do this much thinking uh, with me and not being more inspiring. I'll wrap up the sermon hopefully with some inspiration for mothers, but I don't know how else to get to the scripture unless I do this digging, if you'll just, just stay with me for a minute. Paul himself demonstrates an adaptability to, to meet certain requirements as a social condition changes. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he urges widows not to remarry but instead indicates to them that in my judgment they're happier if they remain single, and he says, I think I have the Spirit of God. Ten years later, however, in writing to Timothy, 1 Timothy 5.14, he says, I would have younger widows marry and bear children. What has changed his mind over that period of time? The conditions, namely, at Ephesus, the younger women who had, did not have the avenues of employment that women have in our culture today, their employment, they might be an outstanding sales lady like Lydia, they might get a position, but basically they were confined to the roles of of woman or mother or prostitute in the city of Ephesus. And, and, and Paul is indicating that by their lack of their not being able to have a role, they're becoming gadabout. And he said, therefore, I would, would that the younger widows would marry. So a condition has brought about a change in his own advice on the subject. In the particular passage where Paul, in verses 13 and 14, appeals to the ruin of uh, man and woman in the fall, and of course from Romans 5 we learn that man is equally as responsible for the fall as woman, uh, he is setting uh, an appeal to the Ephesian church through Timothy based upon something related to the ruin of mankind. It might also be suggested that it is entirely possible from Paul's writings to make a different appeal based upon not the ruin of woman, but the redemption of woman through Jesus Christ. If we start from the cross and redemption rather than from creation and the fall, we might reach different conclusions. Galatians chapter 3, 28 is the key text on redemption. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And through the work which Christ has, bought, has brought into the world, he was born of woman. It was to a Samaritan woman that he talked and revealed more of himself doctrinally than he ever did to the stuffed shirt Nicodemus. It was Mary who sat at his feet and whom the Lord encouraged to doctrinally remain there. It was Mary Magdalene and the other woman to whom he first appeared after his resurrection. It is Joel who prophesied that on all flesh the Spirit would be outpoured, including sons and daughters and men servants and maid servants. It was the daughters of Philip who were prophetesses. Priscilla, Phoebe, uh, Eutychus, uh, Eutychus, uh, Syntyche were all women associated with Paul. In short, there is another strand of truth emerging within the New Testament which suggests that it is not conditioned by culture but it has an eternal focus, and that is the basic equality in the sight of God and in the Christian church of men with women. And as the changing social scene has existed for 20 centuries, the leaven of the gospel or the seed of the gospel is in this time coming to a more full fruition that we see certainly the opportunities for our society of a many roles for women within the context of our culture. And we see also a re-examination within the Christian church and indeed even within this church on that particular subject. I come from a, a, a understandably Pentecostal background where for us this was never an issue. You know why? We had in, as Pentecostals, I guess, this crazy kind of an idea that the Holy Spirit would give us in due time the understanding of Scripture. And it's kind of akin to what happened in Acts chapter 10. If Peter would have waited for a theology of whether or not Gentiles could be baptized in the Holy Spirit, uh, he would have waited until the kingdom come, until he'd ever got his theology worked out. But he had the experience of going to Cornelius' home, and when he had the experience, then he began to understand certain segments of the scripture in a new light that he'd never seen before. And I think in regard to, to our experience, we sense that stress of Joel that upon men and women I would pour out my spirit, and therefore we began right from the inception of ordaining women and accepting them in equal positions of full ministry in the church. Now that a later generation has come along and begun to think through the scripture in, in new ways, it, I think there is a, a wisdom seen to this earlier policy. And certainly the, the eternal strand of the gospel is the position of equality. The only place, by the way, where subjection is called for on the part of women in the scripture, in the New Testament, is in regard to three things. Subjection within the church, and this is required of all of us. I am in subjection to you, and you are in subjection to me, both men and women. Uh, subjection is called for on the part of daughters toward their parents. The same subjection is called upon for the part of sons for their parents. Subjection or submissiveness is called upon the part of the wife 
for her husband. And this is kind of really akin to the nature of the subjection of Jesus Christ, who is equal with God, yet voluntarily placed himself and under the headship of the Father, that the Father's and the Son's purposes might be accomplished through that means. And therefore, starting from a position of equality, when you are single, if you marry, you voluntarily come in under a position of submissiveness, not a slavishness, but a submissiveness, so that there is a carrying on better of the purposes of God for the family. Now, I wish we had a half an hour of questions and answers after this sermon. I just feel terrible about preaching a message like this and not really having a dialogue on it. But we'll go on. If I made myself perfectly clear, I hope I have, and I hope I've really been faithful to the Scripture. This has been my goal. There's a last verse here, verse 15, which describes the Christian woman as mother. Yet woman will be saved through bearing children. You may read, you, in witnessing to a friend, certainly would rather use John 3.16 than 1 Timothy 2.15, wouldn't you? I mean, you know, um, what is Paul saying here? That the way to be saved eternally is to have children? Well, we know that a word, the meaning of a word is determined by its context. And uh, their salvation may be a term, which is most often used in the New Testament, to refer to eternal salvation. But it may also refer to being saved from something not related to salvation, and in this case it appears to. The word childbearing is used only twice in the New Testament, both times in this Timothy uh, section, in 1 Timothy 2.15 and again in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14, I would that younger widows marry and bear children. 1 Timothy 2, it's a noun, and 1 Timothy chapter 5, it's a verb. What is, uh, what is he saying here? What is the salvation of woman that is in childbearing? I think it's evident from the text of 1 Timothy 5 itself, namely, that there were women in the Christian congregation who, because they did not have means of employment once they became widows, were using their time idly and uselessly, gadding about, gossiping, and being busybodies, and Paul says they need to be saved from that, and the solution is marry, bear children, and bring them up rightly so that they might meaningfully be involved as persons in their world. Paul, recognizing immediately as he writes, yet woman will be saved through bearing children, recognizes that that's not sufficient, for if, if a person is a gadabout widow, and she remarries, and she's uh, kind of flaky, you know, her salvation is not simply in bearing children because the kids will be as flaky as she is. So what he says is she'll be saved by bearing children and then that great condition. If, he says, she continues in faith, love, and sanctification. Now, if what Paul is saying is it's not enough to bear children. One must also bring them up. And in our day, by the way, when women may find many avenues of personal fulfillment in many different fields, the tendency perhaps has come lately that a person who elected to be a wife and mother was somehow choosing a lesser role. Not at all. That is a legitimate, divinely honored, approved role. And if you don't believe that, then just ask yourself how in the world you got here. We all need mothers. And, uh, and God ordained that uh, the role of mother should be one which is filled with the deepest kind of intense fulfillment and meaning possible. And uh, therefore, St. Paul says, successful motherhood is based upon these words, faith and love and sanctification with modesty. Now, what's he mean? When we use terms like faith, love, and holiness right away, we're in general terms. And it's always difficult when we use a general term and to make a concrete application. And I thought in my mind, what person in Scripture best epitomizes those words, faith, and love and sanctification. And it didn't take me but a minute to locate someone who fulfills all of those admirably. It is Mary, the mother of our Lord, who demonstrates in her own life these three words tremendously. When the angel appears to her and brings to her the promise of the Christ child and that she is, con she is to conceive, then she responds with faith, so be it unto me. She has faith in the Lord's word, she demonstrates her faith through her recitation of Scripture when she comes to Elizabeth and gives her, her, her Magnificat to God. And she not only demonstrates faith in the Lord, but she demonstrates also faith in her Son. She, that faith is demonstrated all the way to the cross when she is there at the cross when Jesus dies. And there is a kind of a faith, intrinsic in motherhood, that if it's the right kind of motherhood, 
believes deeply in faith in the Lord and believes also deeply in one's family, believes deeply in one's children. And if I don't embarrass my own mother, I'll say that one thing I have never doubted, and that is my mother's faith in me. Never for a moment have I ever believed that mother didn't believe that certain things couldn't happen in my life, but always that encourager to me she has been. And, and that's what Paul is saying of mothers here. Have faith. Faith in the Lord, and I translate that. If you have faith in the Lord, you're going to have faith in others. You're going to have faith in your children, in your husband, and you're going to live life with faith. What about love? Love here is agape. It's the kind of, of looking at the best interest of another person. It's not so much on the emotional plane as on the truly servant plane. Of, uh, it's emotional, but it's more than that. It's looking out for the other person's welfare. And uh, the love of, of Mary is demonstrated in her being willing to, to literally uproot herself for the sake of her children, to go to Egypt if necessary, uh, to live with ridicule if necessary, uh, but to, to love her son and uh, to love the Lord. And not only that, but to continue with sanctification. This word sanctification or holiness, which means to set apart, sometimes is mistakenly understood to mean that that a person must dot every I and cross every T. There's no room for failure as a mother. Well, I suspect that there are some mothers here who on occasion have lost their temper, uh, who on occasion have been short with their child or with their husband who may have failed in keeping the budget balanced for that particular week. You know, Mary as a mother was a holy mother, but she also had an occasion when she terribly, so to speak, blew it. Do you recall the time in the Gospels where she brought her other children, her other uh, sons and daughters, and tried to get Jesus away from the crowd because he appeared to be a real embarrassment to the family and seemed to, you know, go off on a little bit the lunatic edge, and she was concerned about his reputation, about the reputation of the family, and, and, and they say, the Lord, your mother's calling for, her, for you. Well, she wanted to take him home and get him down and calm again and, and get him to be the ordinary kind of a person he'd appeared to be before this time. She made a mistake. But did that mistake cause her not to be holy? No. Because she, she was designated as a special role. She was set apart as the mother of the Lord. She was set apart to serve the Lord, and uh, as she stuck, stuck with the Lord with her love and with her faith, all things would become plain, and her mistakes would be covered up, because love indeed does cover a multitude of sins. What God is asking uh, for today in mothers is uh, great faith and great love and great holiness, personal standards. I think the word wholeness better translates holiness. A wholeness, a kind of a, of a, of a personality and a life that really inspires other people to be like you. All of this with modesty. Just to comment on that word modesty in verse 15. Sometimes translators have a field day in confusing us. And it appears to be the case here because in verse 9 we also have the word modesty, but it's not the same word as in verse 15. Instead, it's the same word as sensibly, which means, again, self-controlled or good judgment. So that Paul is saying, let women have, Christian mothers have faith, and love and holiness, all of it with good judgment and self-control. And as a result of that, their families and the world will be blessed. Now, isn't it fascinating to look through this text and to be able to ascertain within it those eternal verities which are unchangeable, faith, love, and holiness, and those other things which may be conditioned with a particular culture and with a particular understanding, but as the Holy Spirit continues to give light and revelation to the church, They become more and more obvious as the years go by. And because of the seed of the gospel in Galatians 3.28, eventually we see the full flowering of Christian maturity in the world today where there is such a beautiful opportunity and ability for women to participate in the life of the church and the life of the world uh, as God has ordained for all women too. I hope that uh, I have caused you to think today I hope that if you have disagreed with what I've had to say, that you'll disagree in love and color me like uh, Phoebe and or Priscilla and Aquila, who got a hold of their minister privately and set him straight. Uh, That um, you'll pray for me. uh, That uh, uh, not only that, but I hope that what I've shared is inspiring to you, mothers. Because even though we say kiddingly, we could not be here without you. Uh, there obviously is something deeper we mean to convey on this day uh, to our wives and uh, to our mothers a great respect and a great love and gratitude for uh, the role and the mission which uh, you have fulfilled in being uh, to all of us 
a mother and uh, someone who has loved us and cared for us deeply. And of course, uh, for those of you whose mothers are no, now not living, this is a special day as well in which you can take the memories of uh, what was communicated to you and, and treasure them and thank God for them. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the counsel of your word, which is ever light to our path. We, Lord, confess our limitation of understanding at times there indeed occur those circumstances like at Cornelius' household where because of an event we are made to re-examine Scripture. And we recognize, Lord, that there is a need in our lives for the continual sifting through the Word that we might have a clear and a good understanding of what you're asking of us. And Holy Spirit, we beyond understanding your word, want to be persons who are filled with your life and your love and your joy. And especially we pray today, Lord, for mothers which are here, that with great grace and mercy you would minister to them. And may this day be a wonderful day for each, a day in which they may have some time and solace to receive the tribute and the honor that is due them on this day. And we give you praise for your being with us as we have asked. In Christ's name, amen.